Welcome to my lecture entitled Drinfeld Lemma for F isocrystals. Uh, these slides can be found on my website at this location. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers of this virtual conference for the opportunity to speak uh, and for putting together an event that can be held in a socially distanced manner. I should also say that I have a very basic draft of the material I'm going to be talking about posted to my website. And I should also mention that my university campus sits on the ancestral homelands of the Kumeyaay Nation, who continue to have an important and thriving presence in the San Diego area. I'm going to begin this talk with a bit of context. Um, so this context comes from the geometric Langlands correspondence. So in this section, let X be a curve over FP. Uh, to prove the Langlands correspondence for the group GL2 over the field uh, Kx, the function field of X, uh, Drinfeld introduced this fundamental idea of considering moduli spaces of Stukas as geometric analogs of modular curves of Shimura varieties. And what a Stuka is, very roughly, uh, it's defined in, with, with respect to X and some test scheme S, which is an arbitrary FP scheme, and an S Stuka on X is a vector bundle on the absolute product X times over FP with S equipped with a rational map from this, this bundle to its pullback by the Frobenius on S, which acts fixing X. So it's a partial Frobenius map on this absolute product. It acts by Frobenius on only one of the two factors. The moduli space of Stukas admits Hecke correspondences corresponding to points of X, which come from modifying a Stuka along the point of X. This essentially means keeping the model the same, but modifying the rational map by rescaling it um, to add or subtract a pole um, along a particular point of X. Um, this construction was eventually used by Laurent Lefort to extend Renfeld's work to GLN, but this required a lot of input from the theory of automorphic trace formulas, uh, and so is maybe not as geometric as one would like, and definitely does not extend in a straightforward way to other reductive groups. However, more recently, Valsal Lafour gave a, a more geometric version of Drinfeld's method that can handle general reductive groups, and this is built upon what's called the geometric Satake equivalence introduced originally by Mirkovich and Vilonen. At a key stage, namely what are called the construction of what are called excursion operators, which I won't try to say more about, uh, this process depends on an idea of Drinfeld that was embedded in the original work he did for GL2, but needs to be made more explicit. Namely, it's the relationship between X and the formal quotient. Uh, you take X times over FP with an algebraically closed field and then formally divide by the Frobenius act acting on K. So again, you take this product, but now you formally divide by a partial Frobenius operator. I'll say more about this uh, on the coming slides. So if you imagine the relationship between X and this sort of formal stacky quotient, um, this, these things are related in various ways. So in the original formulation of Grinfeld's lemma, you express a comparison of the, of the profinite at all fundamental groups of X and this strange object. And you also compare lease or constructible L adic sheaves where L is a prime not equal to P. Um, in this talk, though, I want to focus eventually on the situation where L equals P. That is, I want to trade a tal cohomology for the P adic vague cohomology that stands in uh, for a tal cohomology when you try to take L equals P, which is called Bertolo's rigid cohomology. Um, it's a generalization of rational crystalline cohomology to the not necessarily smooth proper case. In this theory, the analog of least sheaves are what are called overconvergent F isocrystals, which I'll say a bit more about later. The analog of constructible sheaves are arithmetic D modules, but I won't really tell you what those are, except to say that they behave a lot like the ones that you see in the Eladic case. Um, I should mention this is loosely inspired by some other work on a variant of Drenfeld's lemma, which is applicable to a different version of the Langlands correspondence. This is a form of Drenfeld's lemma involving perfectoid spaces. And this is relevant to the local Langlands correspondence in mixed characteristic 0p. Um, 
so ongoing work of Farg and Schulze uh, addresses this Langlands correspondence with L adic coefficients where L is not equal to P. And there's also some hope of adapting those ideas to an L equals P version. The model would be Colmez's P adic Langlands correspondence for the group GL2 of, over QP. And there's some hint that you may be able to get something meaningful out of this Drinfeld lemma construction appearing in a paper of mine with Annie Carter and Gergely Zabrady, where we use Drinfeld's lemma for perfectoid spaces to give a theory of multivariate phi gamma modules. Now, the classical theory of phi gamma modules introduced by Fontaine gives you a concrete description of the category of p-adic representations of the Galois group of a finite extension of QP. This is a construction that gives you representations of a product of such groups described in terms of some ring with a few operators acting on it. Um, these look like rings of power series in as many variables as you have factors in the product. Okay, so before I talk about F isocrystals, let me say something about Drenfeld's lemma in its classical form for schemes and uh, also what implications it has for sheaves in L adic et module where L is not P. So throughout this section of the talk, X will be an arbitrary scheme over FP. It will sometimes be restricted, but I will state the restrictions when I need them, otherwise it's arbitrary. K will be an algebraically closed field of characteristic P. X sub K will be the base extension of X from FP to K. And phi sub K will be the pullback to XK of the absolute Frobenius on spec K, the P power map on spec K acting uh, to fix x. So I will consider this quotient x sub k mod phi sub k, and I will think of it purely as a formal object. What I mean by writing it is that an object of some type over this thing is an object of the same type over xk equipped with an isomorphism with its phi k pullback. So if you like, it's a torsor for the discrete group generated by phi k. So most of the time we'll be considering either sheaves of some sort, on xk mod vk or schemes over xk mod vk. And in either, either case, you can think of an object defined over xk equipped with an isomorphism with its vk pullback. So we'll start with coherent sheaves on x. This is the original version of Drinfeld's lemma as presented in the PhD thesis of Eichel L. Uh, for this, I have to assume x is finite type and projective we'll deduce some corollaries that have weaker hypotheses later. Uh, so for X finite type and projective, the base extension functor from coherent sheaves on X to coherent sheaves on XK mod phi K is an equivalence of categories and it preserves cohomology. Now, what do I mean by preserves cohomology? The cohomology of a coherent sheaf is its coherent cohomology. The cohomology of a coherent sheaf on this quotient is, well, you take the sheaf on xk, make a complex out of it uh, by the action of phi k minus one and take the hypercohomology of this on xk. When x is spec of fp, this is essentially saying that a finite dimensional k vector space with a semilinear bijective phi k action has a fixed basis. Uh, this is a form of non-abelian Art and Schreier theory, which in its basic form is, is due to Lang from his PhD thesis and is presented in modern language by Katz, in particular expose of SGA7. Uh, and in fact, this is really almost enough to prove the general case. So the general case follows from this special case of a point using the fact that it, because X is projective, a coherent sheaf on X or alternatively XK can be recovered from its space, the spaces of sections of high twists of E by the O of one that I've implicitly chosen when I say X is projective. So the statement does not depend on the choice of an ample line bundle, but fix an ample line bundle for definiteness. And then uh, X, is, uh, X carries the sheaf O of N and I can twist by E to get E of N. And for if I take the spaces of sections um, of En for n all sufficiently large n, those carry enough information to recover E. I can use the proj construction to recover E from those spaces of sections. 
And if I do this over xk, of course, these spaces of sections carry an action of phi k and therefore have a fixed basis. And I can use that to re reconstruct the desired sheaf on x. So now I'll start ticking off corollaries of this, starting with a corollary about finite at all covers. Let f et of x be the category of finite at all schemes over x. Then I deduce that the base extension functor from finite at all schemes over x to finite at all schemes over xk mod phi k is an equivalence. Notice here, I don't make any assumption about x other than it's a scheme over fp. The point being that this statement formally reduces to the case where x is affine and a finite type over fp. The affine case is a straightforward reduction. The finite type case uses the fact that an fp algebra is a co-limit of finitely generated fp algebras. Just you take all finite sets and you take the fp algebras that they generate. So if x is affine and a finite type, I can choose a projective compactification. Affine schemes are quasi-projective. Affine schemes of quasi-finite type at least are quasi-projective. And then uh, if I have an object in this latter category, it gives me a finite normal cover of yk divided by Frobenius. And then uh, using the previous theorem, I can infer that this comes from some finite cover of y. And then I can use that to recover the finite at all cover of x that I'm supposed to start with. And once you have proved a theorem about finite at all covers, this uh, formally implies some corollary about fundamental groups. So for this, let me assume X is connected. Um, so if X is connected, then the quotient XK mod phi K is again connected. And for any geometric point of XK, the profinite fundamental group of this quotient using the space point is naturally isomorphic via the, the map between the two spaces to the profinite at all fundamental group of X itself. Now, this uh, statement comes with a bit of a warning. I didn't say that XK is connected. I said that XK mod phi K is connected, meaning any disconnection of XK that is stable under the action of phi K must actually be a trivial disconnection, uh, where one of the parts is empty. Uh, in fact, it is not true in general that xk has the same connected components as x, and this is already true if x is a geometric point. If x is a geometric point, then pi naught of xk is a copy of z hat indexed by identifications of the two copies of fp bar inside k and l. However, phi k acts on this z hat by translation by z, and therefore you get no uh, phi k stable disconnection. And that's what leads to the conclusion that in this case, you get a connected, a connected stack. So there's a non-trivial uh, fact embedded in this connectedness, but it is true. And you then are able to compare fundamental groups. Um, without the connected hypothesis, you can say that for any prime L not equal to P, the pullback functor from least QL bar sheaves on X to least QL bar sheaves on XK mod phi K is an equivalence of categories and preserves cohomology. Again, cohomology here has to be interpreted as some sort of hyper cohomology for the action of phi K minus one on the right hand side. And I put QL bar here because that's what's most relevant for the Langlands correspondence. Of course, I could have put QL or any intermediate field as well, because this is really just a consequence of the fact that when X is connected, you have a comparison of fundamental groups because least sheaves can be interpreted as continuous representations of the profinite at all fundamental group in the case where X is connected. Now, in order to talk about constructible sheaves, I need to introduce one more statement, which is again a corollary of the original Drinfeld's lemma. The quasi-compact open subschemes of XK mod phi K are exactly the pull packs of the quasi-compact open subschemes of X. Why is that true? Well, the quasi-compactness assumption here um, means that I can assume that X is affine and a finite type over FP. Now, I should maybe caution, when I write quasi-compact, I mean not that the scheme is quasi-compact, but that the morphism to X is quasi-compact. If X itself is quasi-compact, then those two are the same. But here, it's really the, the immersion that I want to be quasi-compact. And so, of course, I can formally reduce to the case where X is affine, and then quasi-compactness means that this open subscheme is the complement of the zero locus of a finitely generated ideal of the coordinate ring 
So I can reduce to the finite type case again. And then in this case, I can choose a projective compactification and then an open subscheme of XK invariant under phi K will also be open in YK and its complement will be, if I take the underlying reduced scheme, uh, it will correspond to an ideal sheaf which carries an action of phi K and therefore by drinfeld zumba must have come from Y. And this essentially gives you the theorem. Uh, this then implies without too much effort that is, if X is a finite type over FP, so I don't have to worry about what I mean by constructible, and L is a prime different from P, then the pullback functor on constructible QL bar sheaves on X to constructible QL bar sheaves on XK mod phi K is an equivalence of categories and preserves homology in the same sense as before. And it's really this statement that's used in the construction of excursion operators, but I won't go into that. One can also make a statement about products of fundamental groups in the following way. Let X1 and X2 be two connected FP schemes, one of which is QCQS, quasi-compact and quasi-separated. Let X be the absolute product of X1 and X2, and let phi1 and phi2 be the partial Frobenius maps on X. So phi1 is induced by the Frobenius on X1 and phi2 by the Frobenius on X2. Then if you divide X by one of the two Frobenius maps, it's symmetric which one you choose, uh, you get a connected formal object. And for any geometric point of X, using that to compute profinite fundamental groups of X1, X2, and this formal quotient, uh, the formal quotient has profinite fundamental group equal to the product of the two fundamental groups. Uh, this follows from the case where X2 is a geometric point using the homotopy exact sequence for a vibration from SGA1, the case of a geometric point being exactly a, a corollary that I stated earlier. And you can make a similar statement for N schemes. Um, there are two things you have to notice. One is that you have to take all but one of them to be quasi-compact, quasi-separated. That hypothesis shows up when you're using the homotopy exact sequence for a vibration. And the other is that you have to do the division by not one partial Frobenius map, but n minus one partial Frobenius maps. You have to omit only one of them. Notice the, the composition of all of the partial Frobenius maps is the total Frobenius map. It's a bit redundant somehow to divide by that. So you divide by all but one partial Frobenius map. Now let's talk about isocrystals. Before I talk about overconversion of fast crystals, I have to consider a somewhat simpler concept where I'll do, be doing a lot of the, the work. These are what are called convergent FS crystals. Let X be a smooth affine scheme over a perfect field K of characteristic P in order to simplify this description. The way you describe these convergent F isocrystals is locally, you fix a formal scheme P over the Witt vectors of K, which lifts X and which carries a lift of the Frobenius on X, which I call sigma. Then a convergent F isocrystal is a finite projective module over the ring of sections of P with little p inverted equipped with an integrable connection, linear with respect to the Witt vectors with P inverted, and also carrying a horizontal isomorphism with its Frobenius pullback. So this is essentially a vector bundle with integrable connection plus a Frobenius pullback. If you're trying to compare this to least sheaves, you might think of the integral, integrable connection as giving you an action of the geometric et al. fundamental group and the isomorphism of the phi pullback as giving you an extension to the arithmetic et al. fundamental group. The resulting QP linear tensor category called F I sock of X does not depend on P or sigma and extends by gluing to general smooth X. Uh, the sigma action then coincides with the functorial action of Frobenius. So you need to do some argument to show that this definition doesn't uh, depend on choices. The most natural way to do this is to consider a site theoretic construction where you somehow take all possible local choices together and show that using all of them is the same as using one of them via, via comparison map. Uh, one of the most fundamental constructions when you consider p-adic coefficients is Newton polygons. Uh, so when you have a coefficient object and a geometric point lying over some point little x of capital X, you can pull back that coefficient object, call it E, to a convergent F isocrystal on X bar. This will just be a finite dimensional vector space over the fraction field of the Witt vectors of X 
of the residue field of X bar plus an action of Frobenius. So this carries um, the structure given by the Dionne-Manning decomposition theorem. Namely, the pullback decomposes as a direct sum. Each sum n is indexed by a rational number written in lowest terms. And that sum n, E sub d, admits a basis killed by phi sub x to the s minus p to the r. Now you can keep track of the data in this decomposition by writing down a Newton polygon. I'll take them to be convex by convention. Uh, the convex Newton polygon will have slope d occurring with multiplicity the rank of E sub d. Um, this will depend only on x, not on the geometric point. It's denoted in np parenthesis e comma x. I'm going to view this as a function of x. Notice the total multiplicity doesn't change. And in fact, the, the right endpoint also is locally constant. Um, and a fundamental theorem of growth in E-cats shows that the Newton polygon function is upper semi-continuous as a function on the underlying topological space. So you get a locally closed stratification by Newton polygons. For example, if you take the universal elliptic curve over a modular curve, that's a rank two coefficient object. Uh, it has generic Newton slopes zero and one corresponding to ordinary fibers, the map from the universal elliptic curve. But there are some isolated points where that fiber is super singular. And at those points, the Newton polygon shifts to one half, one half. Now, there's also some structural impact uh, of the Newton polygon on E itself. This is given by Katz's slope filtration theorem. If the Newton polygon is constant as a function on the underlying topological space, then E admits a filtration by convergent F isocrystals, where each successive quotient has all Newton slopes equal to some value mu sub i, and these mu sub i form a strictly increasing sequence. We say that E is a unit root object, or a tal, if the Newton polygon is constant with all slopes equal to zero. And in that case, you have a further theorem of Katz and Crew that says that such objects correspond to least QP sheaves via the functor of taking Frobenius invariance. So this may, might make you think that we can do some sort of devisage on convergent F isocrystals in the following way. Given a convergent F isocrystal in X, there exists an open dense subscheme U of X on which the Newton polygon is constant. Okay, we've thrown away some information by going from U to X, but let's suppose we can, we can handle that. Uh, then you can study the object in U using its slope filtration. Each successive quotient is up to a possibly fractional twist associated to some least QP sheaf. And least QP sheaves you can study using, for example, the fundamental group effects is connected. The one catch is that the extensions between these pieces do not come from least sheaves and therefore require some analysis directly in the category of isocrystals. For example, suppose that there are just two distinct slopes so that the slope filtration degenerates to a short exact sequence, then the extension class defining this exact sequence belongs to H1 of the object E2 dual tensor E1, which is not unit root because E1 and E2 are themselves each of a single slope, but those slopes are different. And so th this product will be uh, an object of a single slope, but not at the zero slope. So it's H1 is not going to be controlled by these sheaves. You have to compute it in the category of isocrystals. Now, let me talk about Drinfeld plumber for convergent F isocrystals. So to formulate Drinfeld plumber, I work with a category of what I call convergent capital phi isocrystals. So I'll explain this in detail for the case of two factors. So let X sub I be a smooth affine scheme over a perfect field K sub I of characteristic P. And for each I, I fix a lift PI to the bit vectors and a lift of Fabanius. And then a convergent V isocrystal on the absolute product X of X1 and X2 is a finite projective module over, you take the product of P1 and P2 over ZP as formal schemes, you take the ring of sections and then you invert P, small p. And then you take a module over that ring carrying an integrable connection linear with respect to the VIT vectors of K1 and K2. Uh, and this object should also carry isomorphism with, with its Frobenius pullbacks, but it's partial Frobenius pullbacks, sigma one and sigma two, 
And these should commute with, with each other, just as sigma one and sigma two themselves commute on the absolute product. Uh, I'll denote the category of these objects by phi i sock of x. It turns out it is again functorially independent of choices. For example, you can use a site theoretic argument to show this. Um, and you can make a similar definition for n greater than two, which I won't write out, but it's, it's quite similar. Now, if you start with a, an f isocrystal, a convergent f isocrystal on x1, you can pull it back to x in, in a very natural way. It's essentially taking the exterior product of a convergent f isocrystal on x1 with the trivial f isocrystal on x2. When x2 is a geometric point, this functor admits a one-sided inverse. You can recover the original f isocrystal by taking phi2 invariance, but this is not an equivalence, as we'll see on the coming slide. So this is a, a fundamental difference with the usual setup of Drenfeld's lemma. You have a pullback functor, but it's not an equivalence. It's close, but it's not an equivalence. But if E is indeed in the image of the pullback functor, then you have, so to speak, an Art and Schreier exact sequence for E. Uh, phi 2 minus 1 is subjective, and its kernel is um, the, the invariance. And this implies that when x2 is a geometric point, um, the pullback functor uh, actually preserves cohomology. Again, cohomology here is defined using one for Banius and here using both of them. Now, there's also a way to talk about Newton polygons, but for this, I really only need the, so to speak, total Newton polygon. This is most easy to see if K1 is FP, then uh, the total scheme X is actually a smooth scheme over, F, uh, over K2. And then uh, an object of phi i sock of x is really an object of f i sock of x equipped with an isomorphism with its phi 2 pullback. Now, there is a, a way to interpret this statement so that it applies to arbitrary k1 and k2. I won't try to give you a formal definition of what convergent f isocrystals are in x, but basically you use the same definition as phi isocrystals, except you only have an action of the product of the two Fermanius maps, not the individual Fermanius maps. Um, and so then you have a forgetful functor from phi i sock to f i sock. And this allows you to consider the, the Newton polygon of an object in f i sock. And a priori, that will be a, a, a function on the total space of x. But if x2 is a geometric point, we prove that actually this total Newton polygon factors through the projection from the total space of x to the total space of x1. Remember, even though x2 is a geometric point, the total space of x is much larger than the product of the total spaces of x1 and x2. So this is quite a non-trivial statement. This is saying that the Newton polygon stratification is actually pulled back from x1. And the idea of the proof is to just take the Newton polygon stratification and apply Drenfeld's lemma to it, the geometric version that talks about uh, open subschemes. So we're using the fact that the stratification from growth and decats uh, does have the quasi-compactness property that I need for Drenfeld's lemma. Now, using this, I can prove a relative version of the Neumannian decomposition theorem, which says the following. If x2 is a geometric point, then any phi isocrystal decomposes as a direct sum indexed by rational numbers in lowest terms, where now the conclusion about E sub D is that its invariance under uh, the kernel of the map V2 S minus P to the R is actually um, an F isocrystal on X1. And in particular, E is a pullback from X1 if and only if E is equal to E0. So this explains why the pullback functor is not subjective, but at least when X2 is a geometric point, it's not so far from being subjective. And the idea of proof is that you first treat the case where the total Newton polygon is constant by using the Debesage argument that I suggested earlier. You treat the steps of the slope filtration using least sheaves, reducing to the usual Drenfeld's lemma for, for least sheaves, um, and then applying the preservation of cohomology to show that the extensions uh, can be descended to x1. Then you have to use the following which is an adaptation of a theorem 
which in its substance is due to de Jong, but was written down in this form by me many years ago, which is that, uh, and, and so the, the original theorem that I'm alluding to is the case where there's only one factor and I use F isocrystals, but of course one can bootstrap up to get this statement. If you, you take an open dense subscheme UI of XI and you take U to be the product of those, then the restriction functor from isocrystals on X to isocrystals on U is fully faithful. For least sheaves, this is almost obvious statement. It's really just saying something about uh, representations of, of groups. Uh, uh, it's quite an elementary statement. This is not at all an elementary statement. It's quite uh, tricky to prove this, but uh, one can adapt uh, to the case of a product. In fact, one doesn't really make a new argument. One essentially reduces this to the corresponding statement for, for F isocrystals. And that allows you to extend this decomposition from um, the open subscheme where the Newton polygon is constant to the whole of X. And again, you have a statement about products of two, two schemes. Um, here, I, I'm going to formulate it in the following way. Any irreducible object is a subject of an exterior product of an E1 box product E2 where EI is an ice crystal on XI. So again, this is done by first dealing with the case where X has constant total Newton polygon, then making an argument using the full faithfulness of restriction to, um, to patch things up. Now, when K1 and K2 are both FP, this has a, and this is the case that's really of most interest for, um, for geometric Langlands, this can be formulated as a sort of product statement for fundamental groups, but here what you have to use is some sort of Tanakhian fundamental group. Um, this was pointed out to me by Dashin Chu that uh, this is both something you can do and also something that you need for, for the applications. Um, there is a, again an analog of, for n-fold products, which I won't write down. Uh, and again, you can formulate it um, to look very much like the fundamental group version of Grim Feldflamen. So now I have to say something about what happens for overconvergent FS crystals. First, let me try to tell you what those are and why they're different. Uh, the reason there's a difference between convergent and overconversion FS crystals is because you can define the cohomology of convergent FS crystals. When you talk about rigid cohomology, you do it without the Fermanius action, and then the Fermanius acts on the resulting spaces. Uh, the, the underlying isocrystal without Frobenius, if it's a convergent F isocrystal, its cohomology is very badly behaved. It's not finite dimensional. And you might see why from the fix. The fix is to replace formal schemes with what are called weak formal schemes. And this has the effect of replacing closed disks with um, some sort of limits over larger closed disks. So instead of consider, if, if X is an affine space, instead of considering strictly convergent power series over the VIT vectors, those with, which converge on the closed unit polydisc, you take some sort of limit over power series convergent on larger polydiscs. And this has the advantage that on this ring, uh, the only obstruction to doing integration is, not, is, is inverting P. Um, whereas here, um, you, you, you lose convergence at the boundary when you do integration. And so, uh, you really have problems with, with Durham cohomology. So you can similarly define overconvergent phi isocrystals by replacing the formal schemes in the, in the, in the definition of convergent phi isocrystals with weak formal schemes. Um, and this is denoted phi isoc dagger of X. And when you, when, you, uh, when you do this, you get a new version of full faithfulness, which is again, based on results of De Jong and myself. Um, which is that restriction from overconvergent phi isocrystals to convergent phi isocrystals, where you kind of forget the extra structure uh, of a weak formal scheme and just view it as an underlying formal scheme. This restriction functor is also fully faithful. Now, one warning about this: this is not, uh, it does not imply that subobjects lift, um, and this is uh, typically seen using slope filtrations. An overconvergent F isocrystal may have constant Newton polygon, but it will not typically admit a slope filtration. Only the underlying convergent F phi isocrystal admits a slope filtration. 
And again, you can do this for more factors, but I won't to save time and energy. We do in the, in the actual work. Now, using the full faithfulness of restriction, uh, we get away with murder in a sense. We don't really have to do anything new uh, except use that previous theorem. And then we, we recover the main results that we had earlier, except now with daggers on them. So for example, if X2 is a geometric point, we prove that any overconvergent phi isocrystal on the product decomposes according to Dionne Manin in the same sense as Bohr for except now the, the, the kernel of phi two to the S on minus P to the R on ED is an overconvergent F isocrystal on X1. Again, E is a pullback if and only if E is equal to E zero and we again can say that an irreducible object in the general case is a subobject of an external product. And again, you can uh, promote this statement into a Tanakhian uh, statement, which I won't write down. So that's essentially what I wanted to say, except for a small number of footnotes. One is that I assumed some smoothness statements in, in what I was saying earlier. This is not really serious. You can use de Jong's theorem on alterations to construct simplicial resolutions of more general schemes or even stacks using smooth schemes. And this is important for the Langlands correspondence because moduli spaces of Stukas are typically not schemes. They're, they're, they're genuine stacks. And so you have to do this kind of formal passage to deal with those. And okay, now I, now I should mention that we, we know the analog of Laurent Lefort's method for p-adic coefficients. This is a titanic work of Tomoyuki Abe, uh, which involves constructing a, a suitable p-adic analog of constructible aliotic sheaves and working with those. They, they have to do with what are called arithmetic D modules in the sense of Bertolot. Whatever these objects are, say you have one of these things on X times K, um, where K is an algebraically closed field. Um, and, uh, then there is a maximal open dense subspace on which this thing actually is an overconvergent F isocrystal. So there's a least locus. Um, and if this object was actually defined on XK modulo Frobenius, then by Drinfeld's lemma, the least locus descends to X. And so you really can, uh, and then on the least locus, you have a, you get a least sheaf that itself descends to X or the analog of a least sheaf and overconvergent F isocrystal. Um, you can uh, then hope to adapt Mount Salt Lefort's construction using this logic. Now, I don't know if this is feasible, but it seems that this is the most serious obstruction to promoting Abe's work from GLN to reductive groups, at least in the, in the automorphic to Gala direction. Now, I should mention in closing that one expects something similar to happen with convergent and overconvergent isocrystals without Frobenius structure. I'm not going to try to define those. It takes more work to define them when you don't have a Frobenius structure. So what you would expect is if you take an absolute product of two schemes, that there's some relationship between the isocrystals on each individual scheme and isocrystals on, on the product with a partial Frobenius action, with one of the two Frobenius maps acting. Unfortunately, our techniques are not able to touch this question even when X2 is a geometric point. They're really dependent on the fact that we have a total Frobenius action. And in this context, you, you, you do not have that. So I don't know how to say anything meaningful about this question. Um, so I'll leave that as a, as a consideration for future work. And I'll conclude with some references, which you can find if you get the slides. These are all clickable links. I'll close there. And I looked forward to interacting with you, many of you in the discussion format that the organizers are setting up um, during the week of the conference. Thank you for listening.